Thank you, Aaron. Am I on? Okay, yeah, I'm on. Okay, um, I'm going to get right into um, a roadmap of what I'll be talking about. Um, many of you know Weston Price very well, but there's some people in the audience who don't, so for the sake of all of them, I'll say a few words of formally introducing him and also of his critics, and um, I'll inevitably get into a little discussion of uh, some of the uh, economic realities and complications of the diet in the Lucentala, which was the very first place that he um, uh, went to. Uh, I'll say a little of my uh, history of my involvement in the Lucentala, and um, uh, then a little bit about the, uh, the village genealogies uh, that I came across, and I'll give some representative results, what you're all waiting for, and then some conclusions and the status of the study. Okay, Weston Price was a dentist who practiced in Cleveland, Ohio in the early part of the 20th century, and he reported that he saw increasing amounts of dental problems among his patients. And these dental problems were not only more tooth decay, but also things like uh, orthodontic problems, just the things that um, were spoken about earlier this morning. Uh, he said that in his research, he was not able to find any causative agent, any um, injurious factor, as he put it. So uh, he eventually concluded that there was an absence of some nutritive factor. Uh, that's not surprising for when he was working. The early part of the 20th century was when vitamins were being discovered. So he was effectively saying there may be yet some other vitamin that might be responsible for the, uh, uh, the increasing difficulties his patients were having. Uh, he wanted to have as controls a group of people that didn't have the injurious factors, and he ended up being guided by anthropologists and explorers who claimed that they discovered all around the world that there were people who uh, had really healthy teeth even though they were living under what the Western world would call very primitive conditions. Okay. He chose populations that were on the verge of being modernized so that there were some people in each group that were eating their traditional foods and some people who were transitioning to modern foods. That would allow him to eliminate the possibility that there were genetic factors that were responsible for the bad teeth, which was an idea that was out there, especially the idea that mixed race people uh, would have bad teeth. And by um, choosing people the way he did, he could eliminate that possibility. In every case that he went to, he found that the people who um, were still eating their traditional diets had healthier teeth than the people who were transitioning to the modern foods. And he published his evidence uh, as photographs and as uh, also um, written work in uh, a book called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. Uh, the Price Pottinger Nutrition Foundation has, kept a, has, a, uh, has copies of it out there uh, with a, a special deal you can uh, talk to them about. Um, okay, many but not all the groups were hunter-gatherers or fisher-gatherers. They were essentially what we would call Paleolithic diets, but they were not all like that. Uh, some of them uh, were eating, were, were what we would call pastoralists, um, and one of the exceptions was the high alpine region of Switzerland where the mountain people were um, said to be eating a diet of um, uh, grains and dairy, okay? As a matter of fact, his first destination was Alpine Switzerland, and the first destination within Alpine Switzerland was a valley called the Lutchen Valley, which you see here, and uh, in German it would be called the Lutchental. And uh, Price states in his book uh, that uh, the people had no doctors and no dentists because they had so little need of them. Well, let's um, put a little box around that. Uh, what does he mean by need? Uh, it may be true that there were some medical interventions that did more harm than good, so sometimes people were better off uh, without doctors, but that was not always the case. Many times uh, uh, doctors did do uh, very uh, worthwhile things. Uh, but if he meant that people were in such good help that they didn't need doctors, then uh, we're going to have to look at that in terms of the demographics. Okay, in the Lutchental, Bryce's host was the parish priest, um, Prior Johann Siegen. Uh, the term Prior is, uh, is a historical term that goes back to the origin of the church about uh, uh, the 1200s. Uh, 
Um, and evidently, Weston Price relied on Prior Ziegen's uh, command of the English language. And uh, Ziegen was said to be uh, self-taught in English, uh, at least according to some of his relatives. Now, um, that's very impressive that he was self-taught in English, but I cannot imagine that he understood nuances of the English language. And it is my hypothesis that um, there may have been some language misunderstandings. When Weston Price said that he wanted to know about the traditional diet, uh, Weston Price was talking about the diet before the time of uh, <clears throat> the introduction of steel rollers that allowed for the milling of grain so that it made refined white flour very accessible to everyone. He was talking about the process for creating trans fatty acids uh, and uh, uh, the increased use of sugar. To Weston Price, I'm sorry, to uh, Prior Ziegen, I believe that the term traditional diet meant the time before the Colombian exchange, before the, the introduction of foods to Europe from uh, the Western Hemisphere, things like the potato, uh, the tomato, corn, tobacco. Uh, at any rate, um, Price doesn't mention potatoes in his description of the Luchental, although he does mention it uh, later on in 1932 when he goes to Fisper Terminin, uh, which is another uh, village in uh, the high alpine region. Uh, he, um, um, he, in, in the Luchental, he really only talks about what was uh, the traditional diet of basically dairy products, uh, milk, cheese, and also uh, grains, primarily the uh, sourdough rye bread. Um, uh, okay, so um, the, the question, though, is that um, there have been a number of other studies of the Luchental, and um, uh, people uh, have um, uh, done uh, research, especially on the, the rather sudden, condensed time frame of modernization that took place that didn't really take place until after uh, 1913, when the tunnel made uh, uh, the railroad tunnel made the valley more accessible. <clears throat> um, and so, um, it, yeah, okay, people were talking about the extreme poverty, and some people were saying that. Uh, uh, thank goodness for the potato. Nobody starved, and very few people uh, had um, um, w were harmed by it in any way, or at least that's what they were saying. Um, and that was um, that, that was uh, what gradually came in in the decades after the um, after the potato came in, uh, which uh, started somewhere. It looked like around um, uh, maybe the 18, uh, 1820s or so, or 18 teens or 1820s. Now, panning out to worldwide, uh, the diets of the groups that Weston Price looked at varied tremendously. There was no one single food that was essential for everyone, um, but uh, all the groups had um, higher levels of um, vitamins, both fat-soluble and water-soluble vitamins, and um, uh, the modernized groups uh, uh, were losing some of that uh, diversity. Um, okay, so beyond the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, and E, uh, Weston Price was asserting there was yet something else, something that he called an activator X. Uh, not too long ago, um, Chris Masterjohn uh, wrote an article suggesting that it was uh, A vitamin K2 or one of, uh, um, or several of the vitamin K2 that were essentially, um, that, that, that basically what that activator X was doing is the same as what the uh, what, what vitamin K2 is now known to do. <clears throat> okay, for the Alpine Swiss, the vitamin K2 was found uh, primarily in the butter from um, uh, the cows when they were up on the high alpine pastures. And uh, here I have to get into another little aside on diet. Several authors have effectively uh, stated, these are mostly Swiss authors, who state that many of the poorest people in the mountain regions of Switzerland would make butter out of cream and then they would sell the butter. They would take it down into the lower elevations. So it was the more affluent people at the lower elevations who actually got to eat the high vitamin butter and uh, the poorest people up in the mountains uh, were giving up their butter and um, with, for cash and with the cash, 
They were buying things like manufactured goods, like musical instruments. Uh, marching band is huge in these valleys, and um, other manufactured goods, and also foods like drum roll here, coffee, alcohol, tobacco, and sugar. Um, not necessarily a good nutritional exchange, but that's what some people were actually doing. So uh, that puts a real monkey wrench into any assertions. Oh, they ate this diet, and therefore they had this health. Um, we're not really sure exactly what people were eating uh, health-wise. OK, so from Price's time onward, um, Price did not work for a university. So all of his research papers and his photographs did not become part of a university archive. Instead, they became part of what uh, for a while was the Weston Price Memorial Foundation. After acquiring the uh, research papers of Francis Pottinger and a number of other uh, researchers, it became the uh, Price Pottinger Nutrition Foundation. Uh, if you want more details of the story at the beginning of this book, Pottinger's Cats, also out there in the lobby, uh, it'll tell you the whole story of the history of, um, of how it became the Price Pottinger Nutrition Foundation, founded in, um, I guess, the 1950s, is that? 1952, okay. Um, now, in 1998, um, Sally Fallon and Mary Enoch published uh, Nourishing Traditions, which uh, made a big splash. It was almost like a, um, a nutritional manifesto. And um, ar around the same time, uh, actually, I think it was 1999, Sally Fallon also started the Weston A. Price Foundation, which I understand is what many people first, when they hear about Weston Price, they hear it through that foundation. Um, it has uh, been very aggressive in its outreach, and that may be why so many people know about it. And uh, it has um, uh, also led to, um, uh, the growing awareness has led to growing criticism, and uh, many people have challenged the accuracy of the things that Weston Price has been saying. And a common question uh, that the critics ask is, uh, what about the short life expectancy and high rate of um, infant mortality in the groups that Price researched? Okay, so uh, that question is, um, well, well, that's the way the question is put, but it's usually put in the context of a discussion about nutrition, so that um, if, there's, uh, if there was high child mortality, the implication is that, well, could the diets have been that good if, if there was high child mortality? So we're going to have to look at the, um, uh, at, at the demographics uh, with that question in mind also. OK, so my study, uh, the Price Sponger Nutrition Foundation had a list of characteristics of all of the groups that Price looked at. And one of the characteristics was that each group had some period of undernutrition. They were not eating low-calorie diets. Uh, uh, but at a certain time of year, for one reason or another, they would have uh, a period of undernutrition. And so I went to the Luchental. It was actually not my first trip, but I figured that since the region was Roman Catholic, uh, there would be a rather easy way of finding out what the um, uh, rules for fasting and, and abstinence from meat were. And I did find uh, some of the, the, the old catechisms that, uh, that gave those rules. In order to help me in my study, I joined an organization called um, uh, the Club for Furtherance of the Lichenthaler Museum. We would call it the Friends of the Lichenthaler Museum. It's, it's an organization of people who uh, donate money and make suggestions for special programs that the museum should have. Uh, this was very beneficial to me. It gave me an opportunity to meet several people in the valley. Uh, I met for one the genealogist and historian uh, Ignaz Bellwald, uh, who, um, about whom you will uh, see a lot more of his work. I had a chance to uh, meet and interact with uh, Joseph Ziegen, who was a nephew of um, uh, the prior Johann Ziegen that you saw before. And um, uh, he and his wife, Clara, I've been very fortunate to have them as mentors uh, when I've been in, in the valley. OK, so while I was in the valley, uh, initially looking at short-term fasting processes, uh, I learned of a genealogy that Ignaz Bellwald had produced for the village of Kippel. Uh, it was published in 2006. 
subsequently, there was a genealogy published in 2015. Uh, there was another genealogy uh, published in December of 2018. Uh, the publication date, the rolling out, was a big deal in the village of Blatten. It um, uh, was it resulted in a publication party where most of the village turned out, which just shows you how much effort everybody in the village put to make the genealogies as complete and as accurate as is, uh, as is possible. Okay. What's it going? Okay. Um, the genealogies are organized according to families. Uh, each uh, family has a unique index number, and then there are other index numbers that allow uh, linking of families to earlier and to later generations. Okay. Um, the way the genealogies, or the way the um, uh, the individual families are set up is the mother and father are listed at the top, then all children are listed underneath. If the children got married, the lemnisate symbol, uh, mathematicians would call it the infinity symbol, uh, indicates marriage to somebody. <laughs> okay, and um, there is also uh, a village indicating uh, which village the person lives in, and that includes all, a number of villages that are outside of the valley. So you can distinguish between people who are still living in families that are living in the valley versus families that are part of the Lichtenthaler diaspora. Okay, one other thing you might have noticed already, I'll show that uh, family once more. This, by the way, is a simulated family. Nobody in the Luchental has these last names. I've picked these last names as being the last names of American presidents or other uh, American people that I know. Uh, for the sake of privacy, I'm not gonna show any uh, individual uh, real families, even if they're a couple hundred years ago. You can see that there are a couple of individuals who are listed as dying on the day of birth, and there are other families where there are uh, children who are uh, dying fairly young. And this led me to realize that um, the records provided in the genealogies could give me a quantitative indication of child mortality uh, in the valley and maybe a qualitative indication of longevity. Longevity is much harder once you start dealing with adults because you've got migration and people leaving the valley. So uh, this question of how much child mortality was there is a prerequisite to the question of um, what about the high child mortality? Isn't the diet then not very good and so forth? Well, this is the route to um, being able to look at that. Okay, so my expanded project became not only looking at uh, short-term fasting processes, but also looking at uh, the, the results of the genealogies. I transferred all the data of all the children into a spreadsheet, and um, then I have a basis for analyzing that spreadsheet. Okay, uh, now I didn't cover everybody. I, was, I limited myself to people who were born between 1700 and 2000, and I also entered only people whose families were living in the Luchental. I did not include anybody in the Luchental or diaspora. Okay, and here is the um, example of the entire spreadsheet. Um, there are over 6,600 individuals that I've uh, uh, covered. There are a few uh, columns that, uh, that indicate which index, which uh, genealogy the person is in and which index number. There's some other uh, columns that give uh, quantitative information, give the information of birth and death about the mother and what the gravid number of the individual is. And uh, then a series of columns on uh, uh, the individual's date of birth, date of death, whether the person is a twin and uh, a male or female. Uh, there are some... Um, other columns that indicate that somebody uh, might be, uh, have survived to adulthood because the, the, uh, there's a marriage partner, even though they ended up disappearing. Now, it seems to me that, okay. Um, deriving, okay, deriving information, um, I use Microsoft Excel. I don't wanna go to a more fancy, um, database program because I want it to be as accessible to other people eventually as possible. And the um, conditional counting, count if and count ifs functions are adequate for just about everything that I need. Uh, 
Okay, the, uh, the queries are organized as other spreadsheets in the workbook, uh, with uh, all the data being one spreadsheet. And um, it, it does require a fairly fast computer. When I started out, I, I was using an, in an Intel i3 processor, and if I did an entry that required recalculation of everything, it would take about 20, 20 seconds before uh, the computer would let me do anything else. Uh, with a, an i7 and more memory, it takes me only about one second. Okay. Now, here's a simple example of what can be done. This is the births per year recorded in the genealogies. You can see the births are going slightly up over time until there's the birth dearth around the 1980s. Okay, deaths per year, I can also calculate. Now, the very low numbers over here, around 1,700 or so, that's an artifact. That's, first of all, I didn't, I didn't enter into the spreadsheet anybody um, earlier than 1,700. And secondly, the death registration um, book from the village, um, uh, from, from the village church uh, from 1688 to 1713 was missing. So uh, that's why there seem to be so few. The other thing you can notice on this uh, is that there, um, there are a few uh, crisis mortality years where the death rate is much higher than in other years. And indeed, there, uh, people know about epidemics that occurred in the valley at various times. Okay. Um, now, the genealogies uh, show another limitation, which is the bane of people trying to do demographic research using church records. And that is that there are a certain number of individuals uh, who have birth records, but there is no death record. What happened to them? Uh, the problem is that there are two separate reasons why there can be no death record. Okay, first of all, uh, there were some parish priests who would not record the deaths of infants and young children. So sometimes they would record um, a record of the birth and then just put a cross by that uh, name. That would indicate that the child had died. But sometimes there's nothing. But the other reason is the person successfully grew up to adulthood and then emigrated. And so um, these two different reasons can have different effects on, uh, on the demographics. Okay. Now, listing of a marriage partner, I showed that before, is one way of showing that uh, somebody survived to adulthood. Another way is those big fat books have an enormous number of pictures, and if they have a picture of somebody then uh, who is, let's say, wearing a military uniform or someone who is a young woman or an older woman, then you know they survived to adulthood. <clears throat> okay, this is just an indication of the individuals with uh, no information beyond baptism. Uh, all the people way over on the right are people who, uh, there's no indication past baptism, that's because they're still alive. Uh, but all the people on the left side from 1700 up to about 1900, these are people that uh, we can presume have died, but we don't know why, we don't know when or, or how old they were. Okay, so for some queries, it doesn't matter. But for other queries, that we really want to know whether um, we're counting everybody or just the people for whom we have death records. And uh, that um, can make a difference in terms of uh, the way the quantities come out. Here's an example of what happens. This is actually a graph made from 100 different um, count ifs functions. Uh, this is the survival curve of everybody born in the 19th century. What you see is a, um, a, a certain amount of uh, infant mortality, then the mortality is less, it never disappears, but then it starts getting greater after age 60 and uh, until by age 100 everybody is gone. Okay, here is the same plot except I've added in what happens if I don't include only those with death records, but I also include all those that I know have survived past age 15, that actually changes the percentage that have uh, died early on. Uh, I can't fill out the rest of that curve because I don't know what the, the distribution of deaths of people that are lost to follow up. I don't know what that distribution is over, uh, over the lifespan. So um, I can only fill out that first part of it. There are ways of filling in 
um, with, let's say, a Kaplan Meyer type of plot. But I think there's some philosophical problems with doing that if you're looking to compare the, the diet within the Lurchenthal against the diet of people who have left. Okay. Uh, here's another plot of basically of the same data, and what the, except that it's been broken out into singletons versus twins. And you can see that one of the worst things that can happen to you uh, is to be born as a twin. Uh, the, the, okay, that's oh, almost always what happened is one twin would survive and the other would die. Okay. Um, here's one more plot of the same data, again, this time broken out by gender. Uh, there's a slightly higher death rate of males in infancy. Uh, there's no indication that women die off faster during their childbearing years. That doesn't mean there were no deaths due to childbirth. In fact, there were, but it means that the number of deaths due to accidents that tended to befall men was just as great as the deaths uh, that, uh, that befell women because of uh, childbirth. The, in fact, the, these curves overlap each other so closely that it almost scares me. It makes me wonder whether I have somehow missed something. And it, Okay, um, the one thing that uh, this kind of plot is not good for, it doesn't tell you any detail about what happened with infant mortality. You can see that it's there, but um, here is the next plot, deaths in the first 12 months of life, again obtained by the same count ifs functions, um, and you can see that over half of all of the infant mortality is neonatal mortality. And if we uh, drill down even deeper into that, into deaths in the first 30 days of life, there are a number of deaths um, in, on the day of birth or a couple of days later, almost as many as occur all through the rest of the, uh, the neonatal period. Um, okay, so I was talking about, um, uh, you could see that some people had died. Uh, you notice that a child dies on the day of birth but he's already baptized. And this is very common in the Roman Catholic regions of Switzerland that uh, baptism was of central importance, so uh, baptism usually occurred on the day of birth. If there were any signs of life, a beating heart, even if they couldn't get the child to start breathing, it's got a beating heart, it's alive, quick, baptize it before it dies. And. Um, uh, so the distinctions between miscarriage, stillbirth, and neonatal death are treated differently in different cultures, and this actually makes comparisons between different cultures very difficult. Okay, in the Lurchenthal, there were more live births dying in the first three days than there were stillbirths, and um, uh, by contrast, in um, uh, Protestant villages in Germany, uh, the ratio would be the other way around. And in England, stillbirth registration was not even required until 1927, and it's believed that a lot of people who died, um, a lot of babies who died right after birth were quietly buried as stillbirths, and they were never even counted. Okay, so this sort of summarizes um, the mortality through uh, age five. Um, it... Um, it shows the, the black and the gray are the neonatal mortality. You can see that almost, in some cases, over half of all the more, uh, mortality through age five is neonatal mortality. Okay. Now, uh, just looking in general, um, you can look at this and say, gee, you know, this, this is kind of a high uh, level of, um, of infant mortality. Uh, despite the fact that, um, that most of it is neonatal mortality. But if you consider that in the context of uh, the 19th century and before, in many populations, especially the, the unhealthy uh, urban populations, the, um, uh, the death rate uh, was sometimes over 50%. So in that term, in that sense, uh, the Lechenthal is not doing badly. You know, they're, um, yes, they've got infant mortality, but it's nothing like uh, the, the worst of what, uh, what you see. Uh, okay, now one final point I want to make is there's a, a basic problem already alluded to that uh, a data set of six, over 6,600 people is really pretty small, and it does not allow for good statistics of some things. I have here uh, a, uh, 
graph of the uh, acceptance of iodized salt in the canton of Valais, where the Lichtental is located. It goes from 0% in 1923 up to about 100% uh, less than 10 years later. That was more, much faster acceptance than many cantons in Switzerland. Okay, so I tried, this was back in 2015, when I only had the um, data from the village of Kippel. And uh, yeah, statisticians are gonna jump all over me. Uh, you've heard the old saying that correlation is no proof of cause and effect. This is a very um, meager correlation when I'm dealing with early childhood deaths um, by the onesies and twosies, but they seem to stop right around when iodine was introduced into the... Um, but then I got uh, the other genealogies. And um, the correlation, uh, such as it was, is even worse. Uh, so I, I can't even say that early childhood mortality stops at the time of, um, uh, of, the, uh, of the introduction of, um, of iodized salt. Okay, so that's, um, that's as much as I impl plan to show. Uh, what are the conclusions? First of all, there exist uh, written accounts describing the diet as people uh, from the richest to the poorest really experienced it uh, while living in the mountains of Alpine Switzerland. There exist village genealogies that allow quantitative counting of births and deaths in various age categories. Put these two together and what do you have? Um, uh, first lesson is the more you know, the more you know you don't know. Uh, there's, there's enough uncertainty about exactly what different people were eating. Maybe it was the people eating the, um, who were selling their butter and uh, eating low-fat cheese and low-fat milk. Maybe the one, they were the ones who had the highest um, child mortality, okay? As for Weston Price's assertion that people in the Lichtenthal had little need for doctors, uh, no, uh, that's excessive. As long as there was any child mortality, they could have stood having uh, good doctors, and they could have um, benefited from good medical care. As far as the people who ask the what about questions and want to denigrate Weston Price, uh, as far as I'm concerned, they seem to be riding the waves of the collective consciousness that there was high child mortality in the past, and they're projecting that onto the Luchental. The Luchental was far from being the worst. Uh, it, um, yes, it had some child mortality, uh, but um, uh, everything from differences in stillbirth reporting to, um, uh, to a, a variety of other things um, made uh, a lot of other places much worse than the Lichenthal. Okay, and finally, uh, an assignment of blame to the diets. Um, I'm, I've met, listed some of the other factors, uh, most of them you know uh, very well about. Um, sanitation, personal hygiene, refrigeration, uh, motorized transport, less horse manure to feed flies, and um, antibiotics. And um, the one that I think is a fairly significant one is uh, neonatal intensive care units. And I haven't even gotten into the one other really important one, which was breastfeeding versus uh, artificial feeding of babies, which was very important for the post-neonatal period. Okay, so finally, well, I mentioned what, uh, what, was the, what were the people eating? There were no food frequency questionnaires. So um, I think I mentioned that point already, that um, it may have been the poorest families who sold their butter and bought uh, uh, less healthy foods in, in place of the butter that may have had the highest child mortality. And with that, I will stop. Um, I, I will mention that there are perhaps um, hundreds of thousands of queries that I could do. Um, and so I will be paying close attention to what questions any of you ask, because that might actually shape uh, what I decide to give priority in, in putting together a book on all of this. And with that, I will stop, and thank you for your attention. That was a great presentation. Thank you. I think this work is really important. I think you give your iodine graph a little bit too, not enough credit because the, I mean, not that there aren't other things that could have explained that, but the peaks of mortality are clearly higher before the iodine yeah. than, than they are afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually thought the second graph was, made that more clear rather than less clear. Uh -huh. I wanted to ask about the potatoes. So 
Yes. It's been a while since I read Nutrition and Physical De Degeneration. I imagine you read this chapter many Me times as yeah. you were doing this work, and so you yes. can probably have much more detailed um, memory of it. But my impression is, you know, Price didn't just go ask the priest what they were eating, but he's got a bunch of photos of the bread that they were cooking in their thing, and surely he would have if in the villages he, that he was visiting, where if they were eating potatoes, maybe it was limited by the time of year that he visited them, but surely he would have, someone would have shown him some potatoes even if they couldn't communicate very well with him, like they showed the bread and cheese. And also, he seems to have um, noted that there was variation in different villages, and so his point wasn't that this is the diet of the valley, okay. but rather, you know, he makes the comment, for example, in one place that they drank wine in this village and they didn't in the other village, and he makes comments about that. So how, how do you think, can you elaborate a little bit on how you think Price would have visited the people and interacted with them and somehow missed the potatoes? Well, okay, as I said, he did not miss the potatoes altogether. Uh, in his discussion of the Lutschental, which is only a portion of what he talked about in Alpine Switzerland, uh, I don't see that he's mentioned them. Okay, um, that didn't mean, the fact that there were potatoes did not mean that uh, the sourdough rye bread went away. That continued to be, in fact, the village of Blatten continues to have um, uh, sort of like a uh, a special event every summer where they fire up the village oven and they make um, sourdough rye bread the old-fashioned way. Uh, so um, it, it's, it's a matter of um, it, the, what people actually ate varied very widely. Um, I, I think he, he may have given some of that, but I just had the impression as I read it that, you know, the, the potato is more important than what he was talking about. And of course, what the heck does that do to this whole question of, uh, of paleo and um, uh, high glycemic index and so forth? Um, what, what I can tell you is that the potato certainly came in by uh, 1815, 1816, and maybe before. That was the year that Mount Tambora exploded, and there was a year without a summer. It was one of the hunger years in Europe. And, um, and so, People quickly figured out that it took less effort per calorie growing potatoes than it took growing sourdough rye bread. And because you have to go through several steps of making the sourdough rye where you just boil the potatoes. So uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, there were no food frequency questionnaires. So real exact uh, correlations between disease and what people are eating are going to be hard to come by. I don't know if that. Thanks, Greg, for the really informative discussion. Right. Um, I think it's really tremendous that you've gone back to really explore some details that you found to be absent um, and to look at the data. So I think that uh, Chris's question was really a very, very important one. And, um, I appreciate you addressing that. I just want to set one item straight as far as the record is concerned, and mm -hmm. that is uh, a little bit of a misunderstanding of the book Nourishing Traditions, which everyone credits um, Sally Fallon and Mary uh, Enig. Well, this was written in the yes. mid-1990s, um, and one of the authors was also the Price Pottinger Nutrition Foundation's director Pat Connolly. Okay. So, thank um, you. You find that in an early in the earliest edition, but you don't see that in subsequent editions. Okay, I'll get. I'll, I will add that to any future talk. Thanks again. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Greg. We look forward to your similar presentations on the genealogies of all the other places that Weston A. Price visited and reported on. <laughs> <laughs> Un unfortunately, many of the true hunter-gatherer diets uh, or hunter-gatherer groups didn't really have genealogies. One, one feature of the Roman Catholic Church, and this being a, a thoroughly Roman Catholic area, was they kept good records. And even though the records were not perfect, they're there, and uh, the genealogist, Ignaz, uh, Ignaz Belwald, uh, 
um, used them along with other records that he gathered from people. Uh, that's going to be difficult to duplicate. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. And the uh, paleoanthropologists and archaeologists have great methods for reconstructing and estimating these kind of things like childhood mortality and health and <laughs> diet from pollen analysis, tooth wear analysis, and but it's much less complete and it's more obscure than the, the these kind of records yeah. that are found in Switzerland. Well, let's thank you, Greg, for your talk, and let's thank him once again. <laughs> In eight minutes from now, the next session will start, so don't go too far, but definitely stretch. <laughs> <laughs>